this speaker is Dr. Barbara Parolini, who is a, a vitreoidium surgeon par excellence, and he is vice president of European Vitreoidium Society and tutor of Bremen Vitreoidium School and Thilasoneki Vier School. And uh, he graduated uh, in Italy and diploma in 1997 and postdoctoral fellowship in UCSF San Francisco and also UMDNJ New York on retinal pigment epithelium transplantation. And uh, she was also director of clinical studies for FDA. And there are multiple peer reviewed publications, book chapters, and the book. And he is a reviewer. She is a reviewer in multiple international journals also, like Retina Glasses Archives of Ophthalmology. So I will ask Dr. Barbara Parolini to deliver her keynote address. Barbara, please. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for the honor of the invitation. I'd like to start my talk with these slides. Uh, it was taken in 2008 uh, when I was invited in Madhya Pradesh for the meeting. And at that time, I was presenting uh, the two years uh, data on uh, autologous transplantation of the choroid for maculopathies. So it's a pleasure for me this time to present you the long-term data of this type of surgery as well as uh, the <coughs> evolution of the surgical technique. <coughs> so in 2019, why to transplant the choroid and maybe the retina as well? Uh, I will tell you about the 10-year experience that I uh, have on uh, the autologous transplantation of the choroid for uh, different types of maculopathies, and uh, two years experience on the transplantation of retina for chronic macular holes, and, uh, and then how I combine the two techniques. So let's start with the choroidal transplant. Uh, these are the publications. I have operated uh, roughly 200 eyes and uh, I will start by reminding you the main steps of the surgical technique. Uh, so it implies uh, to detach the retina and, uh, sorry, let me go back, uh, to detach the retina with a subretinal injection of VSS. The retina should be detached at least for 200 degrees in the temporal quadrants. And then um, a peripheral retinotomy is performed uh, as, anterior as, as anterior as possible, close to the ora serrata, in order to expose the subretinal space, as uh, I am doing here. That is the CNV that has to be removed. The feeder vessel needs to be closed by diatomy. Diatomy should also be applied in multiple steps to induce a microtrauma in the choroid that stimulates the revascularization of the patch. Maybe I had one video just to, sh yeah, just to show you how, no, it doesn't work. Anyhow, that is the first step that shows you how a full thickness RPE and choroidal patch is isolated with the vertical scissor. You see underneath the white sclera. Uh, PFCL is used to stabilize the, the patch. So this is the sclera and this is the first cut of the patch. And then uh, PFCL is injected to stabilize the, the patch and the patch is transplanted under the fovea. I'm moving the retina with this uh, blunt forceps and then the patch is moved. We need to cut a huge patch because the edges are damaged by the instruments. And so we need to make sure that we have a good amount of area of healthy looking RPE that will finally support the fovea. And then the retina is 
folded on top of the patch by moving PFCL from the subretinal space to the preretinal space. And uh, um, the final tamponade, uh, I have always used uh, silicone oil 1000, but uh, just recently I started to switch to gas in order to avoid the complication linked to the silicone oil. And this is how it looks uh, one month after the surgery. This is the patch. It always looks darker than the surrounding colloid. And uh, this is the harvesting area of bare sclera. Let's move to the case series. I have, uh, this was a previous data collection of 180 operated eyes with both exudative and atrophic maculopathies. I have followed them for up to 10 years. And uh, for 88 of them, I have a complete uh, data collection with at least two years follow up. So about the functional results, these are the, um, the, the, the gain in vision that resulted to be clinically significant. I had broken the whole group into diagnosis, different uh, diagnosis. And uh, I have seen that the uh, gain in vision is significant when we apply the technique to wet AMD, hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic, or CNV from other sources. It is not clinically significant when we apply the technique to atrophic maculopathy. And uh, telling the truth, mm, I have seen some improvement in vision also in the atrophic maculopathy cases, but after two years, I observe a relapse of atrophy. So the result does not last. Instead, in the wet uh, cases, uh, when a patient starts to improve vision, he will keep improving vision in the later years. 40% um, of patients gain 15 letters or more. 40% of patients gain reading ability. Uh, the improvement in vision is slow and progressive, so you will not see your patient improving the month after surgery. He will improve after six months, after one year, but then he might improve even more in the later years. So this is a, a great example of a good indication. This is my best case. Pre-op, a very good retina with external retina maintained at OCT. This is a CNV that has been treated multiple times with the intravitreal injection. And this is how it looks seven years after patch surgery. This is the retina. You can see the external retina very well. And this is not a CNV. This is the patch of choroid. This patient, she's a teacher. She can see 0 0.6 and have good reading ability. And this is another example from pre-op. This is fluid, the retina, and the CNV. This is one month after surgery. This is the patch. It seems like the photoreceptors are not visible, even less than pre-op. But if we wait three months later, and then six months later, and then one year later, they progressively show up again, and vision improves both far and near. So I am always asked, yes, your patients are improving vision, but where are they fixating? Are they using the retina on top of the patch or somewhere else? So only microperimetry can answer this question. And uh, these are two examples. This is the central area of the patch with the sensitivity, good sensitivity. So what about complication? 10% of our patient, 11% have a retinal detachment that can be in, uh, operated. Uh, some, sorry, some of them have non-treatable complications like atrophy or recurrent CNV. These are the bad cases, unfortunately, that we risk to miss. These are the best indication, RPE tear, subretinal hemorrhage, and non-responder to anti-VEGF. Uh, of course, we can discuss about this, uh, but uh, you know we, we should operate patients with good-looking retina and uh, a choroidal pathology that is not responding well to other treatments. Um, 
So these are the best prognostic factor. A patient that can still have some vision, so don't operate end stage counting finger patients. They will not gain any vision. And we need to see some healthy external retina preoperatively. And it is not about age, because I have some very old patients that have gained both far and near vision. So this is the best indication for, RP, for RPE choroidal transplants. This is not a good indication. A gen the generated retina with no photoreceptor visible Counting fingers for more than six months is not a good candidate. He will not gain any vision if you transplant the choroid. So what to do for these patients? Uh, I don't know if I still have time to present you the preliminary data on uh, RP and retina changes, but I can tell them uh, on a personal level, should I? I will try to be very fast. So I ex explained to you, uh, I explained to you the statistics and all the data uh, that I have studied on choroidal transplants. And those are very good, solid data coming from a very long follow-up with uh, statistical uh, analysis. What I'm showing you now is only a preliminary trial. Uh, there are uh, evidence in the literature that the retina can be transplanted. We uh, the, there is evidence of ectopic synaptogenesis and the remodulation of multipotent cells in the retina that can reprogram into photoreceptors. So since I have tried to transplant the retina in macular holes, I have also tried the combined transplant of choroid and retina. I will quickly move to that because I don't want to take too much of your time. So in a case like this, I have tried to transplant the choroid and also to harvest a patch of, here I, chose, I have chosen peripheral retina to transplant on top of the choroid and um, I finished the case uh, uh, in the same way reattaching the retina under silicon oil. So basically, in this case, I have placed the patch of retina on top of the choroid. You might say why there and why this way. N nobody could tell me why. I, I, I wanted to try with the peripheral retina because it is described that it has the potential to reprogram into good photoreceptors. So this is pre-op. This is one week post-op the original retina, the patch of retina, the patch of choroid. Actually, the difference is uh, striking. In the retina, there are multiple striking changes in the post-operative time. This is after one year. Uh, I will move to some functional result. Uh, doing microperimetry, I can see in two years some um, gain in uh, sensitivity and fixation on top of the patch. This is one more case where I had a macular hole, so I have placed the retina inside the macular hole on top of the choroidal patch, and this is the microperimetry postoperatively. The last case, uh, see, look at this. This is the best case. Original retina, the patch of retina, the patch of choroid, with improvement in microperimetry. So in the end, I think that while I am sure that a patch of choroid can really save vision in the good for the good indication in some eyes, I also have uh, some preliminary data to make me think that the retina transplantation have potential, have potential, and we should move forward and study more of this topic as well. Thank you. Can you take the uh, questions later on? Later. later. Oh, at the end? At the end. We have time for that. I will
So this is, uh, these are the faculties for our talk on diagnosis and management of macular and submacular pathology. So we finished with uh, Dr. Barbara Parolini's excellent guest lecture. And these are the uh, full uh, pathways for our journey. So the next will be Dr. Rajesh Sahai with his presentation of retromacular traction and epiretinal membrane. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for a very nice presentation, Dr. Barbara. I was quite zapped. Maybe I may have forgotten a few points in my presentation. <laughs> so the topic that I'll be discussing about the anatomy of the vitreous, it's largely uh, unseen part of the eye, which occupies the maximum uh, you know, area in the eye. So we'll be discussing about the structure we're trying to see, which is not very well seen. And then PVD, anomalous PVD, <coughs> vitromacular traction syndrome and uh, PMM, that is premacular membrane, or ERM. So this is the anatomy of the inside of the eye related to vitreous. Everybody who has seen something in the vitreous has inscribed their names there. You can find out so many names in that photograph. So it starts the vitreous starts forming at the third or fourth week of gestation, and the secondary vitreous replaces it by 12 weeks. And uh, it has a base, as you see there, and the core and the cortex. So what we will be actually discussing here is the interface, the cortex and the internal limiting membrane. So the vitreous is mainly, uh, it, it is type two uh, collagen, and for type nine, five, and 11. And it acts as a scaffold, and hyaluronic acid is there in between, which swells it up, so makes it largely invisible to all of us. And uh, until middle age, after that, the hyaluron starts shrinking, or there are other aging changes which take place, and th there is onset of uh, PVD. So the normal PVD, the normal PVD is an aging process where the vitreous liquefies and uh, the, there is dehiscence at the interface. So these are age-related changes in the collagen structure of the co-formation co of the collagen structure and decrease in the hyaluronic acid concentration. And we all know that the, uh, the females have lesser hyaluronic acid inside the vitreous. So it may be related to hormonal changes as well. Could be light-induced light damage or could be because of the free radicals. So by uh, 65 years, 65% 65 of the population will have PVD. And if we survive till 80, 85 years, almost everybody will have a PVD. The, <laughs> the sequelae are usually glare. Vitreous usually is thought to be vestigial, but it's quite important to you know, prevent uh, those glares in our eyes because the wavelength of the light, the visible light is actually not scattered because of the inflation of the uh, collagen fibers. So if, if there is, uh, if, uh, see normally it should happen that the complete vitreous detaches from the interface, but sometimes there is anomalous posterior vitreous detachment where there is uh, the liquefaction and the dehiscence do not match. So the vitreous effect is that there is vitreous kysis. So there is a split between the layers of the vitreous and a, and a layer keeps plastered to the internal limiting membrane. So this is vitreous kysis, and uh, this split can be anterior to the, hyaloid la uh, the hyalocyte layer. It's a monolayer of uh, uh, the cellular element of the vitreous, and uh, it could be posterior to the layer of hyalocytes. The macular ef uh, effects will be VMT, exudative e ARMD. We have seen enough evidences now that constant vitreous traction can lead to uh, you know, exudative ARMD. They could be CME because of the same mechanism, macular The mechanism is related to the glial cell proliferation and you know, cytokine uh, you know, recruitment at that area. And optic disc effects are neovascularization and vitreous hemorrhage. And if, if the vitreous detaches centrally, but it is attached somewhere in the periphery, we can have peripheral tears, these retinal tears. And there could be subtle degrees of macular traction, which is could, be, could be causative 
or contributed to the macular edema. So vitreo macular attraction syndrome, let's come to, the, uh, to my main topic. So the first thing is to understand the definition. The VMA is elevation of the cortical vitreous within three millimeter radius of the fovea. It could be focal or it could be broad, depending on the size, if it's less than 1500 microns or more than 1500 microns without any change in the retinal contour on OCT. And vitreo macular traction is with changes in the retinal structure. No full thickness interruption of layers. It, it again can be focal or broad as you see in this picture. So the symptoms here are decreased visual acuity, metamorphopsia, micro, what happened here? And you see here, there is pull, because of the pull, there are changes in the outer layers of the retina in, uh, involving the ISOS junction and the photoreceptors. Since this is, uh, and as I, as I told you earlier, that there, there is a split in the uh, vitreous cortex, so which is mainly responsible for the premacular membranes. The premacular membranes can be thin if it is, if the separation is posterior to the hyalocyte layer. So these can be cellophane uh, uh, maculopathy, or if it could be, it is thicker, which causes macular pucker. So there is a difference in the forces that act here. It is more centripetal if it forms the, uh, you know, pucker. In macular holes, there has to be some attachment to the optic disc, which is known as a vitropapillary uh, attachment. So if there is a vitropapillary attachment, if there is macular attachment, then there could be formation of macular holes. So this is a typical uh, picture of a epiretinal me membrane. So there is fibrocellular proliferation, commonly in the macular region, intraocular surgery, in the secondary causes are intraocular surgery, inflammation, ischemic vascular disease, retinal tear, retinal detachment, and intraocular tumors. Symptoms again can be metamorphosia, diplopia. Uh, that could be because of foveal ectopia. The fovea is dragged to one side and decreased vision. Majority usually are better than 20, 50. The signs are in a thin membrane, it can be mild glistening of the ILM. There is a grayish white membrane causing a pucker. Visu vascular tortuosity and obscuration under the ERM can be seen as you saw in the last picture. And the, the course can be, there could be spontaneous separation of the membrane with improvement in visual acuity. In one study uh, th that involved 324 patients, at 33 months follow, 49.5% maintained visual acuity within one line of initial acuity. So there's a few pictures. So this is a, a fundus photograph, an angiogram, and the OCT picture of an ERM. Yeah. So since this is a surgical process, so one, one thing I needed to mention is that LHEP, this is PANG introduced lamellar hole associated epiretinal proliferation. These are very tough membranes. There are no contractile elements in it, and these are highly reflective lines on the OCT. These are associated with poorer prognosis than the lamellar macular hole without LEHP actually. So slit lamp biomicroscopy was the first thing that uh, we usually uh, used to see the uh, PVD or any vitromacular changes in the vitromacular interface. Ultrasound usually is done in opaque media and it identifies the total vitreous detachment which is actually missed by sometimes by OCT, but the best modality is the OCT. <coughs> So these are the other pictures here. You see that the spontaneous separation of the vitreous is there. This is a diabetic uh, uh, case where there is a diffuse macular edema with pull at the fovea. Similar pictures. Refraction maculopathy. And so as I described earlier, this is the change. And let's go to the uh, therapeutic therapeutic part of it, the main therapy still is surgical. The pharmacological vitrolysis has a role in it because, okay, okay. So this is one animation, let me show you. Okay. So 
fruit is important that if you if you try to peel it off in one piece, probably uh, will create de-roofing and there could be a macular hole formation. So what we do, we move around, we peel from all around and lastly we peel over the fovea. That's it? Okay, thank you. So next is uh, macular hole in attached and detached retina. We'll uh, skip the obvious things which you know definitely and we'll be more concentrated on the practical points. So it is first described in uh, 1869, the whole concept. And then the macular hole surgery success reported in 1991. And that time it was reported 58% and 73% different studies. But recent closure rates are close to 90 to 95%. In fact, few studies are claiming more than that. So diagnosis, initially it was a sridlam biomicroscopy and as a gas also it was shown by sridlam biomicroscopy. But of course now it is replaced completely by OCT. And there was uh, very few differential diagnoses like lamellar macular hole or pseudo hole, which you can jolly well differentiate with the OCT. The classifications are there, very details, the biomicroscopy, the interpretation, and the OCT classification and the corresponding international vitreomacular traction classification. And there is a classification of the macular holes, uh, the full thickness variety, stage two, three, four, which you can see, which is corresponding with the international vitreomacular traction study. So this is for reminding the people about the different layers of the OCT, which is given by Giovanni Staudinghi in 2014 of Thalmology, you can see. And because of that only the prognosis and uh, how it is getting closed, because there are three, four types of closures also in the macular hole, so which decides the prognosis also and the future vision. The stages of macular hole, you can see the stage one is impending macular hole, where the cyst is there and there is some vitreomacular traction. And when the cyst only there and there's very small, there is a defect in the neurosensory retina that is the occurred macular hole or stage one B which you can see nowadays with the NFAST technique and also it is a computer generated uh, volume analysis. You can see nicely the vitreous cone still attached and having attraction which elevation of the roof of the cyst in the uh, macula. And this is the classification giving in short that the which layer getting damaged in the one A, one B, then stage two is the eccentric hole you can see in the photograph C it is a full thickness. Then the D, you can see the stage three hole. And then uh, photograph E, there is a pseudo operculum and no vitreomacular traction, you can see. And photograph F, they're showing, you can see there is some hyperreflective material there and some defect in the ellipsoid zone, but the hole is closed for surgery. So prognostic indicators, there are lots of prognostic indicators people told. The duration, stages of macular hole, size of macular hole, the minimal hole diameter, which they are telling now that is the very important thing, the maybe the most important thing. And then morphology and thickness of foveal photoreceptor layers, then defect in interdigitation zone, ELM or ellipsoid zone. Then there is hole forming factor, macular hole index, uh, and then tractional hole index. And latest, they are claiming this one, the computerized aerial designing software for macular hole volume, which all claimed in different literature that it is they, the, the factors who decide the ultimate vision and the closing percentage. The dye we use, triamcinone we used to use before, then indocinine green, triamcinone blue, now we graduated to the brilliant blue. The adjuvant we used uh, autologous serum, platelet concentration, fibrinogen tissue adhesives, transforming growth factor beta two and thrombin. The instruments, island forces, diamond dust scrapper, finessel loop, and uh, even the PFCL also you can say mention. So this is the one case of the reverse clap technique. We will show a few videos. And you can see this 12, 1200 micron is the vessel diameter. And uh, the, the steps are the same. We do the vitrectomy and then uh, we do the posterior detachment and 
then we stain with the brilliant blue dye and then with the fenestral loop here we just from all around take the island and we trim the island with the cutter only so that it fits you can see the island stained with the brilliant blue dye and then we do the fluider exchange and Definitely, we should be very careful not to suck the island flap also. And that is the, you can see the gas bubble up. This is the post up and nicely close the hole. And there is one traumatic macular hole. There's extensive scarring and uh, involving part of the fovea. And it is a duration of the long duration of two years. You can see the scarring. This is a 27 gauge surgery we did. And here also, not much to be done. We cannot take the island from above the arcade area. So we just took the island with the fenestral loop, with the flap, and put it inside the hole. And uh, if you see, the result was very good last week. whatever flap is possible from whichever quadrant there is not much choice basically because those are scarred beyond uh, doing anything boxing and caroling and setting the island And then do the fluidal exchange. And we can see the result with a closed macular hole. And see the hole closed also. This is definitely different because the other part is not at all there. So we cannot do much. And then with the ten temporal flap technique also it is there. You can show you. Only the temporal flap we took and put it back, but basically it is more or less like the previous one. Here, we'll take them with the island forceps itself. And did only that only, and not the full flap. And there is one RD with macular hole. So what we do, usually the RD with the macular hole, either it is a high myopic guy, or the hole is due to the retinal detachment itself. There is one uh, encircling band. So we did three retinotomies, and then took out the encircling bands, subretinal bands, and then we put TFCL. And then with the island, uh, so we stained with brilliant blue below the TFCL, uh, and then we took out the island with the island forceps, and then we finished the surgery the normal way. And 
you can see the closed hole here below the silicon oil. Thanks for that. Thanks, Abhijit. So you have said actually 93% of the holes close with uh, even the inverse slab technique. So if the hole is not closed, what to do? I think that's what is going to be discussed by Dr. Jaj. Over to you, Dr. Jaj. Good morning, everybody. Let's look at what do we do for the management of a failed macular hole surgery primary failure. Before going to failure, what is uh, defined as success is type 1 closure, where you have a closure of the foveal defect with intact retinal layers and the ellipsoid zone of the uh, photoreceptors uh, as post surgery. So we have uh, type 2 closure, which is either V shaped or U shaped. V shaped, there is only a disruption of the uh, photoreceptor ellipsoid zone, whereas in U type, there is a still persisting foveal defect with uh, the rim of the macular hole attached to the RP. Uh, U type is considered as a failed macular hole surgery. And uh, small macular hole, unlike very large macular hole, it closes from inside to outside. So these persisting outer lamellar uh, defects will take a very long time and it, it is not considered as a failed macular hole surgery. So uh, a failed macular hole surgery to define, it is assumed that a patient, uh, the uh, patient had an adequate ILM feeling and adequate gas tamponade uh, before defining as failure. So the risk factors, all of us know that a large macular hole, more than 800 microns uh, minimum diameter of the hole, chronic holes with uh, sub-RP precipitate and RP degeneration or traumatic macular holes with uh, Skysis. So the usual surgical techniques which we are going to describe are a, a, a simple repeat fluid gas exchange for early failure, ILM free flap technique or transplantation, lens capsular flap transplantation, autologous neurosensory retinal full thickness retinal free flap transplantation, and rarely amniotic membrane uh, transplantation and, and uh, described techniques of arcuate retinotomy and radial incision. So the inverted flap technique, as already shown, is for prevention of a failure of a large macular hole. So this was first described by Navraki, and uh, the technique is when you fold these ILM flaps and put it to, clo to plug the macular hole, the ILM not only acts as a scaffold for the migration of the Mueller cells, but it has neurotrophic factors which helps in the survival of Mueller cells and also the survival of photoreceptors. So the here, the technique is, after a PVD induction and BBG staining of the ILM, multiple radial uh, flaps are raised from the arcade towards the macular hole, and it is uh, uh, left it attached to the rim of the macular hole. And once all these flaps are uh, raised and attached, uh, with a low uh, suction of the uh, cutter, it is trimmed and uh, the residual uh, flap is gently nudged into the macular hole to plug the macular hole, after the fluid air, fluid air exchange is done. So uh, this this is where it hel helps in the uh, migration of the Mueller cells and in, this is basically used when the macular holes are larger than 800 microns uh, and, uh, and a long acting uh, gas tamponade is given. So coming to the first procedure for a failed hole surgery, especially for early sur surgical failure, like two to three weeks after the macular hole surgery, you have a configuration like this with elevated rim of the macular hole with a cuff of subretinal fluid. This is usually due to an inadequate tamponade or poor positioning by the patient. So here, this is the situation where only a simple fluid air exchange and a long acting gas tamponade is required. So as seen in these case examples, this is a primary failed macular hole surgery and the configuration that we are talking about, a fluid air exchange and long acting C3FA tamponade results in ty type one closure. So coming to the next technique, which is the ILM free flap transplantation, the already peeled area of ILM, the temporal edge of which a small flap which is uh, uh, taken and uh, placed uh, over the macular hole. So, so that is the technique uh, of free flap transplantation. So what we are showing, this is a modification of the original technique where we do the uh, raising that flap, we do under PFCL, and here it is staining the, the uh, ILM under the PFCL bubble. 
so that uh, and uh, and this is the already peeled area of ilm from the edge of which a small uh, flap is taken which is uh, around 0.5 millimeter larger than the macular hole diameter and then once this flap is taken it is it is dragged under the pfcl to the foveal area in the original technique it's done under saline so but it's very flimsy and it could float around and create problem that was the, the that was the trouble with the free ilm flap technique so this technique we find it it is just dragged and put and after that uh, uh, it is gently nudged to into the macular hole area to plug the macular hole and a careful fluid air exchange with low air pressure is done uh, first removing the all the air anterior to the pfcl and then uh, at the disc not to dislodge that free ilm flap that is kept over the macula there is a modification of this technique wherein uh, uh, a hinged flap is raised from the temporal area and used to plug the macular hole here as you can see uh, this advantage is that uh, during the fluid air exchange it doesn't get um, uh, displaced during uh, uh, the procedure so that's about a hinged uh, transplant ilm flap transplantation now coming to the next technique is a capsular flap transplantation low posterior this uh, when patient is a pseudophagic and uh, uh, and you are doing a failed first surgery uh, after tripan blue staining of the posterior capsule a small flap which is slightly larger than the macular hole is taken pinched with the micro forceps and it can be put over the macular area it would be a good idea to uh, put a viscoelastic on that and then place it so that it doesn't get displaced or after the fluid air exchange you can place it there with a drop of viscoelastic so that it doesn't float anyway that is much it is little thicker than ilm it doesn't float around so once you place it over that gently with the uh, soft tip or with the micro forceps you can nudge it and keep it uh, over the uh, um, macular hole area and then uh, after that do a, a gentle fluid air exchange with a low uh, air pressure and uh, followed by a long acting gas tamponade of uh, C3F8. So this um, is another technique when especially in uh, myopic eyes with staphyloma, two weeks you can see that it is still in position at one month, it results in a type one closure. So if it is a phakic eye and patient is undergoing phaco combined with uh, uh, macular hole surgery, second, mac second surgery, primary failed macular hole surgery, the anterior capsule uh, after the rexis, which is stained with stripe and blue, can be taken and preserved in a, a, a moist in a petri dish and uh, until the phaco emulsification is over and then uh, it can be hand fashioned with the scissors uh, into a size which is slightly larger than the macular hole diameter and after the fluid air exchange this uh, flap is uh, a small viscoelastic drop is placed uh, and then with the viscoelastic that uh, capsular anterior capsular flap which is slightly larger than the macular hole that is placed over the uh, uh, over the macular hole and that also uh, remains in place and then since it's already fluid air exchange done i long acting uh, gas can be used and uh, in the initial time you can see the capsule in place which acts as a scaffold for the migration and closure uh, migration of muller cells and uh, uh, closure of the failed macular holes large macular holes so now recently uh, it has been shown that in myopic eyes with staphylomas and chorioretinal degeneration it would be very difficult to take an ilm flap or if you don't if you're not doing a capsular transplantation the from the periphery of the retina uh, after cauterization as dr barbara had already seen uh, already shown us that with a cautery a small um, flap piece of the retina full thickness retinal flap is taken under pfcl and it is dragged and put over the macula and uh, uh, oh, and after three months the macular hole closes and the retinal tissue is taken up this is being described for staphylomatous eyes where uh, the eye primary failed macular hole surgery so uh, it has been shown we have limited experience a couple of cases where it was already associated with retinal detachment when we were doing retinal detachment and macular hole second surgery we have a uh, uh, couple of cases experience with this just to mention about steve charles technique of uh, temporal c-shaped arcuate retinotomy along the nerve fiber bundle this doesn't cause scotoma because it's along the nerve fiber bundle it relaxes the uh, tissue and uh, nasal displacement of this bridging tissue reduces the horizontal diameter and results in the closure he has shown that it doesn't cause much of 
paracentral scotoma with the arcuate, sco arcuate retinotomy. And radial incisions of one millimeter till the edge of the macular hole relaxes the macular hole and results in the closure of the failed large macular hole surgery. So just to end the thing, the adjuvants that we use is viscoelastic and uh, the other ones are autologous platelet concentrate and autologous whole blood. This basically used to keep the transplanted tissue, whether it be ILM or the capsular flap in position during the fluid exchange or after the surgery. To conclude, the above uh, described techniques prove useful, especially if you are encountering a large and refractory macular hole uh, which has failed after the surgery and which had pa in the past poor surgical outcome. These novel techniques reveal advancements in the surgical technique with better anatomical outcome. However, the long-term functional outcomes of these techniques are yet to be uh, analyzed. So thank you all for attention. little change in the plan of uh, talk order due to some problem in the computer. So Dr. Norris Babu will present us the surgical management of submacular hemorrhage. And after that, we will put the lecture of Dr. Shubham Pal, submacular hemorrhage with anti vegf TPA and gas management. Thank you, Abhijit, and once again, it's very, yeah, you see, sorry, okay, yeah, okay, thanks, Abhijit, for the invite, and once again, I'd like to thank all the people who are sitting here, I think it's nice to see the people uh, sitting here for the submacular surgery when a lot of things are going on in the uh, antiseptum. So, as usual, nothing to disclose financially. And submacular surgery is basically the blood which is present in the potential space, which is situated uh, between the retina as well as the RP. There are so many causes which can lead to this particular condition. So the earlier uh, speaker, Dr. Barber, was showing about uh, the submacular CNVMs where she removed and transplanted with the RP. But nowadays we come across a lot of submacular hemorrhages, subretinal hemorrhages with the TCV, right, with or without treatment. Usually one of the goals of the treatment while uh, doing a PDT along with the uh, aflibercept or uh, ranibizumab is basically to close the polyp so that you will not have hemorrhage in uh, those cases. And the other cases include trauma, angioid streaks. And <laughs> when we are doing the surgery also, we can uh, make some complication that can lead to submacular bleed, especially when you are doing a buckle surgery. Usually our uh, drainage is a blind procedure. We usually drain the sub uh, subretal fluid with a needle. And if you do somewhere closer to the vortex vein, there is always a chance of the blood uh, occupying the subretal space. And if it's not cleared, then there is always a chance of uh, poor visual outcome. And when you're doing a scleral, I mean, uh, strabismus surgery, there is a chance. I have never done a strabismus surgery, so I don't have any experience in that. So we can have in a penetrating trauma as well as in a blunt trauma. You can have both the supracoroidal hemorrhage as well as the subretinal hemorrhage in these cases. And uh, RAM is other case where you will have hemorrhage in all three planes of the retina, intraretinal, subretinal, as well as the preretinal. So what happens? You should not allow the clot to remain subretinally, especially in case of trauma, to stay for more than 24 hours because all the damage to the retina overlying the clot over the macular area happens within 24 hours. That is because of the presence of uh, iron and hemosiderin or the fibrin in the blood, which is toxic to the retina. The, when the clot retracts, it can damage the photoreceptor as well as the physical separation of the retina from the RP causes atrophy of the both and can result in a discipline scar and poor, poor visual outcome. So when you come across a choroidal tear which is passing through the fovea just away from the fovea, if there is a hemorrhage subretinally, go for a gas injection, the earlier the better, actually. So there are various grades of subretinal uh, bleed, right from 2DD occupying the macula to the equator and uh, more than 50% of the globe being occupied. Dep depending upon that, we can strategize our uh, management of submacular bleed. So 
what are the good prognostic factors? If the patient comes to you with submaxillar bleed within less than two weeks duration or less, can you operate or when you manage, usually the outcome is good. And if the patient has got a very good visual, uh, I mean vision prior to the disease, there is every chance that the post-surgical uh, or post-management vision will be good. But if the patient has got relatively very thick blood at the fovea, if it is larger, if it's more than a 3DD, and the eyes with the AMD along with the membrane and the blood and uh, the hemorrhage of longer duration that is more than two weeks. All these cases carry a very poor prognosis when you operate. So there are various uh, options. I think uh, uh, something like TTI, Dr. Subankar will be discussing. I'll just skip that. Injection of intraocular gas with or without TPA. And uh, we can just go for a pneumatic displacement with anti-VEGF. So we'll be talk, uh, talking about the blood clot removal surgically. Usually we go for a standard three port pass plana vitrectomy. Usually we use 23 gauge. And sometimes we'll have to convert to 20 gauge for one port because sometimes the membrane associated under the retina will be so thick, it's very difficult to remove. And usually in, uh, then you go for the clot evacuation with the forceps or with the short needle, do a fluid air exchange and endo laser and treat it like a giant turtle tear. Usually you go for ta gas tamponade or oil. And usually the visual improvement happens in 30 to 50% of the cases and complications include the recurrent turtle detachment, EVR changes, cataract, and of course recurrent submacular bleed. So these things I'll uh, skip because it's, uh, will be discussed by me. So this is one of the case of a traumatic uh, choroidal tear. And this is an indirect choroidal tear. We'll be having a direct choroidal tear also. A direct choroidal tear happens usually at the site of the impact. Indirect happens concentric to the disc. And this uh, particular person is fortunate because the choroidal tear is not passing through the fovea. If it passes through, then there is a chance of poor visual outcome. And they will go for uh, CNVM also over a period of time, usually after eight or nine months. So in this case, we just injected. The gas made the patient prone. I think by third or fourth day, the blood has uh, been removed from the macular area, usually they, they will have a good visual outcome, but still there will be some scotoma. So this is one case where we can see a submacular hemorrhage. It's not very dense uh, associated with the vitreous hemorrhage. This is one of the cases where we went in for surgery. So what we usually do is do a nice vitrectomy. You will have to induce TVD. And the induction of TVD should be up to the ora because we are going to create a retinotomy. There should not be any vitreous posterior to your diatomy or the sclerotomy you are going to make. If there is any vitreous posterior to the retinectomy you are going to make, then it's going to be disastrous. And we usually induce retinal detachment in these cases by injecting the balanced salt so solution. Usually what I do is it's an automated injection. I in fill the silicon oil injector with BSS, mount it with a 44 gauge needle. And usually I inject the fluid in multiple uh, places, at least three or four places, minimum four. So what happens is you can see the fluid when it is injected, you can see the retina being detached. It's an attached retina. We have to surgically induce uh, the detachment. When you keep injecting, multiple bubbles form. When you do a fluid air exchange, just nicely all this bubble coalesce to have a nice detachment. So usually I go for a, yeah, so that's how the retina is induced. Once it is induced, you go for a fluid air exchange because all the fluid comes down, the retina detaches nicely. Then you diatomize in the periphery, closer to the aura. As I have told you earlier, actually it's better not to have any vitreous posterior to the diatomy where we have done and where we are going to create the detachment. Once the uh, diatomy is done with the momentary vitrectomy mode, create a giant retinal tear. If it is more than 180 degree, it is feasible for us to do the surgery. Once the GI, I mean retina is detached, fold the retina over the nasal side. We can find nice uh, membrane along with the blood. So you can remove that surgically. So in this, it's quite good actually. So we removed it with the forceps. What I usually do is remove this membrane. I put it on the nasal, then uh, resettle the retina, and then start uh, chewing the membrane. Literally, it is like chewing only. Okay. So there is some atrophy actually. We have not done any RP transplant. Once it is done, again, you re-inject, treat it like a giant retinal tear. This is the first post of day of this particular patient. I think he went on to improve only six by 60, and you can find some loss of uh, RP in this case. This is another case with the uh, submacular hemorrhage or subretinal hemorrhage where we have, again, uh, and it's more of a membrane actually in this. 
as I have told already. So there is a membrane under the retina. Already the patient has undergone some peripheral retina because it was started by my fellow. So we are going to inject the subretinal uh, BSS with a 44 gauge uh, needle mounted on a silicon oil injector. You can find out nicely the bubble is forming. Once it is formed in multiple places, do a fluid air exchange. Then as usual, the procedure is the same. In the ORA, temporarily, comfortably. You make a nice retinotomy, fold the retina over the nasal part. I usually don't use uh, PSCL while uh, removing the clot. Maybe at the end we use. So in this case, you can see the membrane which is surgically removed is very dense actually. So you are, as I've told, now I inject PFCL, settle the retina, float the membrane over the PFCL. As I've told, this membrane is usually very difficult. It cannot be chewed with the 25 or 23, so sometimes you will have to go for uh, 20 gauge vitrectomy to chew that retina and uh, remove it completely. Once it is done, go for a uh, fluid air exchange and the uh, oil injection in this case. And this is the fi final outcome. This is also not very great improvement. I think six to 36 or so. So these are the poster pictures of some of the cases uh, where we have done the submacular surgery. You can find out this is a temporal retina where we have done the retinotomy and uh, we have done a giant retinal tear which has been treated like a GRT. This is another case with subretinal bleed. So in conclusion, if you have a submacular bleed, the natural history shows a very variable visual outcome. Most of the time it is usually bad. So nowadays, uh, one more technique what we are doing is if, the, if there is only blood, there is no membrane and if it is quite bullous, what I do is after doing a vitrectomy, we go induce a PVD, inject PFCL and make a peripheral retinotomy. The PFCL stays inside the eye for three to five days. And by the time, and the patient is made in supine position. By three to five days time, all the fluid, I mean the blood under the retina is expressed through the retinotomy which we have made peripherally into the vitreous cavity. And then actually after three to five days, we go for second surgery. During that time, we do the laser and remove the blood and uh, replace, after doing the laser, replacing the vitreous cavity with the silicon oil. So in case of submacular hemorrhage related to CNVM, in AMD, it has got a poor prognosis, but if it is uh, due to PCV most of the time, the outcome is very good. So the adjunct of TPA cannot be uh, underestimated, but the problem with TPA is cannot act in a blood which is clotted. Only if the blood is fluid, it will be acting better, not in a clotted blood. So with this, I would like to thank Dr. Abhijit for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Naresh. The next speaker is Dr. Shubhankar Srikal for uh, submacular hemorrhage management with anti-VHF. Plasminogen activator and gas. <coughs> yes, yes, yes. We have used Paco Crab, and the other thing is we have done by manual also. Put a chandelier, take a 20 gauge scissor hold the membrane, cut it into multiple pieces, and make a retinotomy. Sometimes even four millimeter retinotomy also, and uh, remove the pieces from that. Yeah, the eye for a sclerotomy, sorry, sir. Yeah. No, usually that's what she was telling, actually. Once we start, it's better to diathermize. And if there is uh, going to be extensive RT loss, I think we can go for RT transplant also. We have to raise the IOP to 70. Yeah. We have to raise the IOP to 70 or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And you have to give some it will bleed initially. Immediately, uh, it's a coroid. And then we have, uh, last time I did fluid exchange also with the air pressure at 50 and uh, 60 and we kept for some time. Then there is a clot and then we removed it. It takes time. That was, uh, I think that was the most difficult time, in fact, when you were removing. Dr. Shubhankar, good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Abhijit and AIOC to, for giving me an opportunity to speak here. I'll be speaking on submacular hemorrhage, uh, role of TPA, gas, and antivages. I have no financial interest. So it's a hemorrhage in the potential space between the neurosensory retina and the RPE. Can be caused by uh, neovascular AMD, PCV, retinal artery macroaneurysm, trauma, myopia. So. The, it may lead to the photoreceptor damage within 24 hours by sharing of uh, outer segment of the photoreceptor, impaired transport of nutrients, direct toxicity by the iron, fi fibrin and the hemosiderin, 
So timely intervention is extremely important. So the natural history has a very poor visual outcome. There is no gold standard treatment. Monotherapy with antivegev showed some success. Antivegev with gas has shown better result, but there is no head-to-head -head prospective trial. Uh, expansile gas uh, causes mechanical displacement of the blood from the fovea. Uh, there are reports of uh, even flattening of the hemorrhagic PEDs along with the submacular hemorrhage after injecting gas. Antivegev has a role in treating the underlying pathology. In the CAS trial group, subgroup of with uh, submacular hemorrhage uh, with antivegev, there was favorable outcome. The role of TPA was first described by uh, Wilson Sariot, the intravitreal TPA, which catalyzes the breakdown of plasminogen to uh, plasmin, which uh, the principal enzyme for the clot lysis. Uh, it also liquefies the subretinal clot and hastens the resorption of pre-existing hemorrhage. The intravitreal TPA with or without gas or antivegev result is very good in small uh, uh, hemorrhage with shorter duration. Subretinal TPAs uh, following vitrectomy is usually for the large long-standing cases. The it has causes chemical lysis to the clot with minimal mechanical trauma. Vitrectomy allows a larger gas bubble. There are uh, some reports of using PSCL intraoperatively uh, following TPA injection. So I'm uh, describing few cases. The first case of a 55-year-old lady with 15 days history of decreased vision, known hypertensive. She came with a huge submacular uh, hemorrhage in the left eye. She was uh, injected with uh, C3F8 and uh, ranibizumab. Two weeks post-injection, the not much of uh, displacement of the blood, so injection TPO was given intravitreally. Uh, one month later, still uh, there are persistent hemorrhage but vision improved to 6 by 12. Uh, FFA was done, did not show any uh, characteristic of a PCV or an AMD or a macroneurysm. Second dose of uh, ranibizumab was given. The se uh, seventh day of this injection, still uh, persistent hemorrhage, so C3 F8 was still uh, again injected. Uh, one month later, blood has uh, come down and the ICG was done, did not show any polyp or VVN. So provisional diagnosis of macronism or AMD was made and she received third injection of ranibizumab followed by two more injections and the hemorrhage uh, resolved completely, uh, vision improved to six by nine. Second case of a 75 year old lady known hypertensive, decreased vision more than a month with finger counting vision, FFA showed a uh, typical retinal artery macronism. We can see the clotted blood uh, of more than a month old she was given injection C3 F8 with intravitreal TPA and ranibizumab. Post injection, not much improvement. C3 F8 was re injected, but still there was not much of displacement of the blood. So, vitrectomy is subretinal TPA with uh, C3 F8 and F liver sept was planned. So, this is the vitrectomy is done. Following the vitrectomy, uh, the tricot was used to check the status of the P PVD and the, the more uh, dependent part, uh, this uh, subretinal TPA was injected using a 41 gauge uh, flexible specialized cannula. Then fluid air exchange was done and C3F8 and f set was given in the same city. Subsequently, she received two more eflibercep. Her uh, vision improved to 22 by 60 and hemorrhage resolved. Uh, case 3, uh, 73 year old male diabetic with uh, 10 days history of uh, decreased vision with finger counting vision. Uh, the ICG showed uh, cluster of polyp with VVN. She was given, uh, he was given anivizumab with C3F8. There was breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage with RPD post injection. Then the uh, ultrasound also showed the vitreous hemorrhage. She was planned for uh, uh, vitrectomy with C3 F8 and uh, second injection of ranibizumab. One month later, vision improved to two by 60. <coughs> so to summarize, uh, the we had uh, one relatively younger and two elderly patient with uh, one now is the macronism and other one PCV. The uh, first one did not have a definite diagnosis. 
So two had a within two weeks a presentation, but one patient had more than a month. All uh, received anti-VEGF and GAS. One patient uh, did not receive TPA. One patient received both intravitreal and subretinal TPA. Uh, yeah, anatomic success could be achieved in all cases. The vision was uh, visual success was maximum in the first patient in the younger age group with relatively good vision in the first uh, uh, initial visual acuity w was better. So the visual prognosis was better in the patient with a shorter duration and lesser uh, retinal damage. Anatomical success could be achieved. Subretinal TPA was very effective in long-standing cases, especially when intravitreal failed. The, there is relatively less complication. Only one patient had breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage or RPE read. So to conclude, timely intervention is essential. Intravitreal gas is effective in displacement of blood, but may require multiple injections. anti has a big role in treating underlying pathology. TPA is effective in dissolution of blood clot, but may not be mandatory. Subretinal TPA is more effective and safe in refractory cases. Ultimate visual prognosis depends on the underlying pathology, presence of sub RCE blood, which cannot be uh, displaced by the gas, the duration of uh, disease, size, and uh, available facility. Thank you, Dr. Suvankar. Now, Dr. Sarwan will speak about the myopic macular hole crisis, octinavid feed, and subretinal PFCs, and now he will summarize our presentation at the end of his talk. So thanks, Abhijit. So there's a sort of a potpourri about uh, some of the uh, whatever left over from all the other speakers. So myopic fraction maculopathy, a lot of times we don't see because we don't do OCT in patients and with high myopia. So any patient with a, a high myopia and a subnormal vision don't hesitate to do OCT. As you can see here, uh, is there any, the, the one of the common theories for this is that the anomalous vitreous which becomes very stiff, even though you may uh, think that there's a PVD, if you look at the OCT, you'll see this anomalous vitreous. Here you can just see the anomalous vitreous becoming stiff. You can see the early tractional changes in the second picture below. And as you can see now, the early skies is happening in the inner layers. And again, you can see in another picture, other eye also you can see the early skies. Is quite much more severe case with the lamellar hole and the considerable myopic macular sciasis. In this case, even more uh, bad. Otherwise, got a considerable macular sciasis and a large uh, full thickness macular hole and a posterior pole detachment. So in these cases, you'll have to intervene surgically. So what are the options? Uh, main the reason for all this is that, uh, again, some pictures showing the uh, sciasis here, uh, the HD OCT picture showing the extensive uh, anomalous vitreous and the sciasis here. So uh, various theories have been proposed. One is their stiff ILM. Uh, because the eyeball is increasing and the retina itself is uh, shorter, uh, the traction from the vessels, centripetal traction of the vessels, uh, RP migration, and the stiffness of the ILM, all these have been uh, uh, proposed as mechanisms for the uh, occurrence of myopic macular sciasis. So initially, people have uh, 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 given considerable prognosis following vitrectomy with the ILM peel. And this is one of the published reports showing the uh, full thickness macular and sciasis. Following vitrectomy and ILM peel, it, you can see the resolution of the uh, uh, skysis and the edema. And one more uh, s s uh, case from the example from the same series, you can see that almost it takes a long time for a considerable number of patients for the uh, subcoval uh, fluid to dissipate. It does not happen as quickly and as a routine uh, recommendation is already it takes considerable time. So Richard Spade, he proposed that it's not necessary to the peel the ILM, and he, he proposed that the, the vitreous is the main problem here, and he just induced uh, complete PVD using trams alone without any ILM peel in patients without any macular hole. So just only myopic macular sciasis and uh, you can support detachment. You can see that after the surgery, I only no ILM peel with only plain vitrectomy and complete uh, uh, peeling of the posterior hyaloid. This is one of our cases where I'm just showing a posterior pole RD uh, the uh, and a myopic macular hole. The problem with these eyes is that because of the lack of uh, extensive chorea capital atrophies, you have a white uh, this thing. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to, uh, uh, I've already put PFCL to stabilize the posterior pole. One is it helps to stabilize the retina while peeling the ILM. Second is uh, the it helps to prevent the dye from migrating under the sub subretinal space. Uh, as you can see, there's a considerable whiteness because of the chorea capital atrophy. When the dye goes, passes under the retina when you in a non-PFCL uh, eye, it can cause loss of contrast also. So what I'm trying to do is I put PFCL, I'm trying to stain the uh, ILM under the, so as you initiate the peel, you'll see that I didn't realize there was an anomalous vitreous here. This is the ILM which is coming off. 
but i can see there's a small resistance which is it can happening from this point so now i realize that's the anomalous vitreous now i'm trying to peel the anomalous vitreous here now this vitreous coming off which was missed in the uh, initial steps so i didn't realize that was there only after uh, staining i realized that the now i'm trying to finish off my ilm peel now and uh, this is one of the earlier cases we didn't do a uh, uh, inverse flap but still this i uh, closed actually so other things have been tried is uh, uh, along with the ilm peel people have tried uh, uh, supporting the posterior part of the sclera by using uh, to support the staphyloma by using maclob buckles there's a small video by the andoplom uh, i have uh, skipped the vitreous surgery where rectum ls already has been done ilm peeling has been done uh, okay so it's coming up here sorry so you can see the ilm uh, routine ilm peel either or with the without the inverse flap you can finish it off and then once you do this then you can go ahead with the placement of the uh, maclob buckle so a lot of times to ensure proper centration people use this illuminated uh, uh, li uh, light probe which is uh, just hooked on to the uh, plumb which will be removed at the end of the surgery just to ensure the the placement is exactly at the uh, fovea and the macula otherwise it is not going to work well so there are various types of plombs the tees is a t uh, in india no, mo, t buckle is the most commonly used because it's quite cheap uh, the uh, Anders plum is not, we not, not much using it. Uh, the second one, the JBL, all those are quite expensive. It's almost uh, 300 euros, I think. So T buckle is most commonly used in India. Some of the uh, reports which have been showing the resolution of the uh, this is a bounce because of the uh, placement of the macula buckle. So uh, when you're doing such a sur uh, surgery, the main thing you have to encounter the lo a lack of contrast because of the uh, this thing. The second part is optic pit maculopathy, which you quite commonly see. I don't know why uh, in other parts of the country also we are seeing, but here in uh, our south, down south, we see a lot of cases. So the where does the fluid come from? Various theories have been proposed. One is the uh, vitreous and CSF, and our situation where the blood vessels. But most commonly accepted theory is the vitreous uh, theory, where the syncretic vitreous fluid enters through the optic pit and then migrates into the subretinal as well as the interretinal uh, tissue. So various treatments have been tried. One is the sort of a barrage laser ac across the pit to prevent, uh, but when, the flu when there's considerable fluid, the laser must are not going to take well and doesn't uh, work in, uh, in, a, in a very severe cases. Second is people have tried just injecting a small bubble and supporting within a pro 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 prone positioning, showing the, uh, th there has been kind of some uh, improvement with this. These are some of the studies which showed the uh, s uh, considerable uh, re recovery of uh, vision following uh, just a gas injection. Then because it was not very successful, people have tried total vitrectomy along with a uh, full gas injection also. Uh, this has also been technique which has been tried with a uh, limited success. Then we, we moved on to uh, ILM peeling. This is one of the very earlier case, 20 guys surgery, where we just used to do the ILM peeling and in, uh, endolase it across the uh, optic nerve pit. But again, we are not very happy with the uh, results. It was used to work in probably 50 to 60% of the cases. And it was not a very uh, predictable outcomes were not very predictable with this side of surgery. So a lot of times we used to do ILM peeling, put gas, and do laser to sort of increase our success. But recently we've been, uh, before that, uh, uh, spayed, before the uh, advent of uh, tucking with t tissues into the uh, uh, pit, spayed, he uh, described inert fenestration. His theory was that if you make an uh, opening in these areas, the fluid, instead of migrating into the retina and subretinal space, it will just migrate out back into the vitreous cavity. So he showed considerable success in a series of four cases. But right now, the popular technique is plugging the pit with any of these components, uh, autologous serum, uh, platelets, or fibrin sealant, or uh, ILM, and as well as... Uh, so this, uh, uh, when you're doing ILM uh, plugging, you try to avoid going uh, uh, peeling across the fovea. The reason being that, uh, sorry. The reason being that what can happen is, uh, so this is uh, where we're just, the PLM, uh, the ILM peel is going across the fovea. So in this case, what happened, uh, you can get a iatrogenic macular hole. As the fluid uh, dissolved, it created a iatrogenic, because of the pa this part of the roof is very, very thin. So nowadays, we usually go for a, uh, peel which avoids going across the fovea just uh, uh, just adjacent to the disc to stay this is a large pit there in a young child actually so i'm just in, uh, doing uh, staining and then we don't go into the fovea this is a papillomachal bundle area the ilm flap is raised and then it is tucked into the uh, foveal uh, that the optic nerve pit and then you in, in, in inject gas after this this is what we do uh, nowadays with just to prevent uh, uh, accidental uh, opening up of the macular hole uh, I'm sorry, accidental creation of the macular hole. So uh, one more, even more easier uh, st uh, surgery is to uh, do a scleral flap. Just take a thin scleral flap from uh, usually in the internal cell quadrant, and then this is trimmed according to the size of the optic nerve pit you want to insert into. You can just hand fashion it with using a scissors. And then uh, just do a vitrectomy. We don't usually do ILM peel in these cases. Just drop the, it's quite heavy. The sclera is quite heavy, it doesn't move around. 
and just uh, push it slightly tuck it uh, not too much pressure you don't want to ner- uh, damage a lot of nerves there but little bit of pressure so that it doesn't move or across just uh, sort of push it into that and then after in- injecting uh, fluid exchange you can either inject gas or oil according to your wish depending upon if it's a child or adult so all these techniques have been this one of the case where we show the response resolution of the fluid after that continuing the gl- still graft in place and the flattening up of the uh, this thing so next is one of the common complications which you see in uh, uh, rd surgery when you are cha- exchanging instruments you can see the uh, pfcl bubbles breaking into multiple uh, small small bubbles so a lot of times what happens these bubbles can easily migrate under the b- into the under the retina through the large retinal break especially the retina is stiff because of pvr so what happens when you have a situation like this because uh, the presence of subfoveal uh, pfcl is going to compromise vision so it will cause uh, permanent scotoma if it left over a period of time so we have to uh, remove this especially if you want to get a good prognosis so there are various techniques proposed uh, one of the commonest techniques which i use is to just in, uh, in inject some amount of bss into the uh, uh, macula uh, till it uh, uh, just uh, en- uh, encompasses the fovea and then using a soft tip touch, trying just to push the pfcl bubble closer to this thing and once you aspirate the uh, uh, pfcl i'm sorry the bss the pfcl also comes along with that so this is one of the techniques which we commonly uh, do so i just showing a small video of that so if you don't have the 38 or 41 gauge needle you can use the 30 gauge needle also this 30 gauge needle can be broken and hooked on to a 24 gauge needle which is usually used for intramuscular injections so in case you don't have availability of the f- it's quite easily available from med one in case you don't have one at hand and you have a case in the theater you can just do this also so just hand fashion so that the uh, the plane should be t- parallel to the rp at the level of the macula when you're trying to insert that so this can be either connected to a 1c syringe and the whole thing has to be primed with the bss uh, so this is actually a two days post op i think uh, in the silicone is inside the eye so just insert ins- inserting that contraption which is uh, the 20 30 gauge hooked onto the 24 gauge needle and then just insert uh, I- just under the retina and uh, one of your assistants can uh, slowly inject the bss drop by drop and you can see the bss is going in and just stop once the en- it encompasses the fovea stop there and then using a 27 gauge uh, fl- uh, flute tip or a 24 gauge flute tip needle then just slightly push it so that it migrates into the uh, main uh, bulb which uh, bullet which you have there and when you once you aspirate it can directly come out through the same opening so i that and you do not because this is this openings are quite small you can just leave it intact you no know, need to laser also but this is a one eight case so i prefer to laser i don't want to have any open retina under me one more technique is that uh, where you directly puncture the outer aspect of the bubble and then try to aspirate with uh, this thing this is actually a pediatric case you can see the bubble there so here uh, we are just making a small puncture with the 27 gauge needle and i'm again using a 27 gauge flute flute tip to aspirate the pfcl out of it so the uh, ru- that bubble remains a little bit intact the size doesn't collapse immediately so sh- you need not keep on aspirating even after the bubble comes that area will be a little bit of a cavity like cystic cystic appearance that doesn't mean the bubble is still in the inside it will have that residual appearance which will uh, iron out over a period of time one more thing which has been described is i have not personally done it till so what you do is you just in the inferior part of the macula so you just make a bulb and then no need to remove it at all you just push it into the uh, center point and then ask the patient to p- uh, do a erect posture because of the tamponade of the gas or the oil which is inside it will push the bubble outside the fovea it will still be under the macula but it will be outside the critical zone so any of these techniques can be tried when you have a post operative pfcl residual pfcl bubble sitting on the fovea compromising vision thank you somebody sir so any questions so that we can take before we summarize yeah please sir uh, i think we had a question for the first speaker yeah definitely No, no, first. No, no, first. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, mostly. Yes, yes, yes. Mostly usually under there because it is giving additional tamponade for the hemorrhage also. And second thing, in most of the vitrectomies also, if there is any blood which is not controlled by raising the IOP, I usually go for an immediate fluid air exchange because under the air, the blood clears the media clear. Yes, yes. It is under the air we do it. Yes, yes. No, but uh, he, but she showed that it she was doing a whole thing under PFCL. Yes, yes. Your your video showed it doing a so both. Not interface. Air vitreous interface. Correct. Right. 
So this interface is different from a fluid uh, vitreous interface. A little bit more and difficult, I would say. And the control cutting that we have in a fluid interface is absent in a air. We tend to take eat up more of the retina. That's Not only that, the because the retina is now pushed towards the posterior pole, when you're cutting, you may accidentally injure the choroid also. Okay, sir. I think I summarize the thing and then take the question because we have to leave the stage to. No, no, nothing people. matter. No, 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 no. Again, please go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, 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 okay. Please. So, <laughs> so I think uh, your idea of uh, stuffing the ILM in the macula hole is logically not correct because uh, if you lift up the hole with the uh, ILM, there will be no space for the migration of the photoreceptors centripetally. So better is to make a flap, just put it <coughs> over the hole and do the fluid direction. Actually, he had a temporal flap video, which he, I think he skipped because of lack of time. So nowadays, people have been shifting to the temporal flap. The last slide had a temporal flap, which he skipped, I think, because of lack of time. So, but both the theories are, both of them, like the, the initial people who proposed the inverse flap, now they also uh, changed. One is not because of the um, uh, prevention of closure. They feel that the uh, damage to the muller cells is much lesser. So, but if you see, even after a few years, uh, after months after doing the inverse flap, the original technique, you won't see the flaps present. Initially, you may see some flaps present in the OCT, but later on, the, it sort of, I don't know what happens exactly, whether retina integrates or the flap disappears. You see that the OCT becomes normal after a few months. So what happens to the stuffed uh, elements of the ILM, we don't know. So, but recently, these same people have converted to temporal flap, where the temporal flap is raised and just like a hinge, to hinge door, it just covers the macular hole. This is mainly to avoid uh, damage to the muller cells, especially the papillomacular bundle layer. Uh, sir, one thing exactly. Macular macular also in, also in fact, they, ha they have, uh, in fact, Dr. Navroki has de described this technique to prevent the dissociated optical nerve fiber layer. I'm talking about the stuffing of the hole with the help of no, ILM. even in stuffed cases, the initial uh, OCTs will have that elements of ILM. But if you see after the OCTs after three four months, you don't no, see that. No, species. that is. I, I think that is a scar tissue. the mechanical damage while no, no, stuffing. No. He's saying it's a barrier to migration. That's what you're saying. It's nothing. It's a it's an anatomical closure of the hole, but there is no functional improvement. The best is, the the best is what uh, is described by the uh, this Shio there. Just keep the flap over the hole. Do the fluid direction. Keep the the place for the centripetal migration of the photoreceptors. I understand, that's what I'm saying. You're uh, feeling that the, these elements are a barrier to the migration. That's yes. what I'm saying. So again, uh, if you go through last year, we had three literature, one from us actually, we have taken 600 as cutoff, the other one from Rajanarayan, they have taken 800 as cutoff. So we have compared conventional versus uh, the ILM flap technique. Actually, at the end of six months, there is no statistically significant difference in the closure rate as well as the anatomical, in I mean, the, the visual improvement actually. So both are prospective with a good sample size. Actually, when you follow up, with maybe single cases may be anecdotal, but when you compare that over a period of time, there is no, not much of statistical difference between both the groups when it comes to the question of vision. So one was in Retina 2018, the other one is in BMC Ophthalmology 2018. So any other questions from the audience? So finally, like uh, this is a sort of a pot query of a various disorder which you commonly see in the uh, your routine uh, practice. Uh, the LHEP is a new terminology which is coming up, uh, which I think Dr. Rajesh Sahai showed up. So it, this, the lamellar formation with a very thin and very flat configuration. He showed one of the clear OCTs, uh, which should repeat the very flat ERMs. It looks very simple on OCT, but if you take it up to the theater to do surgery, you'll feel that when you're peeling, parts of the superficial retina are coming along with the ILM, and you see that the undersurface of the ILM will uh, ERM will have uh, xanthophyll pigment sticking onto it. So you'll have a lot of doubt whether you're stripping off superficial parts of the retina. So that's uh, one of the problems with the operating on LHCP, the lamellar hole with the very thin and flat appli applied uh, ERM. So that's one of the things which came out of uh, uh, Shahai's uh, this thing. And the failed hole macular holes by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, George. A lot of times we encounter not every holes, uh, probably every, uh, every ten, one in 10 cases will not close from a routine surgery. So see the larger holes and the old people who do not push in properly. So what a lot of techniques he described. The anterior and the posterior capsule should be done as a last resort. So ideally, you should prefer something which is inside the, the mainly the either hinged flap or a free flap, which is much more uh, anatomical. Then uh, we had Dr. Abhijit showing uh, some, some of the difficult cases in RD and uh, post-traumatic. Uh, and he skipped uh, five, the lack of time, the temporal flap, which was a nice video I, I saw yesterday when he showed me, but uh, unfortunately, he could not show it. Then Shubhankashree, uh, how to tackle both uh, uh, narration, Shubhankashree, and various techniques, how to tackle subject and blood. And mine was some of the uh, other uh, allied uh, miscellaneous diseases which we see. 
thanks for being till the end and any f questions we can still take it we have one or two minutes left of time thank you